I am, uh, I'm really excited this morning, not only because last night was maybe the best win in a decade for uh, my Scarlet and Cream, but um, even more than that, I'm excited because today we're starting a brand new journey together uh, as a community, and that is we are going to, over the next few months, uh, be digging into uh, one of the most powerful, potent, beautiful, freeing, challenging, counterintuitive portions of Scripture Uh, in the entire Bible. We're going to be digging into Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And it can be easy to kind of brush off and be like, okay, Jesus gave a sermon. I'm sure he gave lots of sermons. What's so big about this one? One of the things about this particular message, um, this is Jesus' manifesto in a sense. This is his kingdom uh, manifesto. In fact, a number of scholars remark that this is the most, like, complete, in, in a brief form, the most complete teaching Uh, of what Jesus believed and taught for his followers than anywhere else. In fact, uh, one one scholar that I read said, you know, the Sermon on the Mount is really, uh, it's a commentary on Jesus' life, and Jesus' life is really just fleshing out uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So as we dig into this, I mean, this is, if you wanted to know what Jesus was all about and what he actually invites us into, um, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, there there may be no better place to go than there. And so it is... Uh, it is a bombshell, just so you know. Um, Jesus brings the heat for like three chapters, and uh, he, just, he just goes and leans in. And it is, it is a bombshell, and if you will allow it, uh, it will blow up your world. Uh, I promise you that. So what we're going to do, just so you know, for the next few months, I don't know how long this is going to go. Um, we're li- li- literally just going to go and marinate in, in the Sermon on the Mount and let it have its way in us. And we'll see how long it goes. I don't know. Maybe we'll, <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to go. Uh, we're just going to do that and uh, just let God have his way in us. And so if you guys are up for it, uh, I want to open up this thing that Hebrews says is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and let Jesus open us up a little bit. That sound good? Sound good? You guys in for that? Yeah? All right. All right. So let's do it. If you've got a Bible, we're going to Matthew chapter 4, end of chapter 4. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, as always, we'll throw up the words on the screen for you. Um, one of the things you got to know when they were putting this thing together, there weren't verses and chapters. That's more for us to find our place. Um, and so to understand really what's going on as we walk into Jesus' words on the side of that mountain is uh, what's happening immediately before it. And so here's what we find, uh, end of chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And news about him spread all over Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases and those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. And large crowds, large crowds began to gather and to follow Jesus. And that's huge as we look at the Sermon on the Mount to know the audience that Jesus is speaking to. Right, it tells us that there's large crowds. And listen to the kind of crowds that are there. So we got large crowds from Galilee. Uh, a lot of Jewish people were in Galilee, different areas. Uh, the Decapolis, the Decapolis, which means 10 cities. It was a, a Greek area. Um, it, was, uh, it was established by Alexander the Great. So you've got you know, a number of people who are there that are Jewish. Uh, some people who are there who are very, very familiar uh, with the ancient Old Testament scriptures, and they are good Jewish people, religious people. But then you've got also uh, people that are not that way. You've got the Jewish and the non-Jewish, the religious and the irreligious. You've got people who are really striving for holiness and people who could give a holy you-know-what. So, and they're kind of all there, and Jesus is going to speak to all of them. So it says, when he saw the crowds... Uh, verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. And we're told that his, his disciples gathered right around him. The crowd is all around them. And Jesus begins. He says this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Got all that? Can we close in prayer and go home? Makes sense? You feel like you really wrapped your mind around it? 
right? These are so strange, right? They, when you read these, they are, it, this is not one of those things that you can kind of give a cursory reading and you just got them, right? They, they are so counterintuitive. And in a lot of ways, it's just like they, they, some of them don't even make sense, right? They push back on everything we understand about how the world works and who is actually blessed, And who actually experiences blessing and who is on top and who is on bottom and who's in and who's out. And Jesus speaks words that you're just like, where in the world did he pull this? In fact, um, I don't know if any of you have read this Christopher Moore novel, uh, Lamb, the Gospel According to Biff, Jesus' little-known childhood best friend. No? It's a fictional work, so don't, you know, get too mad. Um, It's a very inappropriate book, and it's hilarious. I'm just going to put that out there. But he, uh, basically, the premise of the book is that God is not so happy with the way the church is telling the Jesus story, so he resurrects Biff, Jesus' childhood friend, to tell the real story. And so he sends an angel to resurrect Biff, and they go to a hotel in St. Louis, and they watch a lot of television, and the angel gets hooked on soap operas and professional wrestling, and uh, to which Biff says, well, now you know why you guys didn't get free will. And so Biff finds a Bible. He spots a Bible in the drawer in the hotel room, and he keeps sneaking away to the bathroom to read it, And he's reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he's infuriated because nobody talked about Biff. He's left out of the story altogether. And so he is sent basically to share the real story of what happened. They tell stories about him and uh, he and Jesus uh, traveling to the Far East and learning Kung Fu together and uh, their adventures with women, you know. And Biff loved hanging around Jesus because he was celibate, but all the women loved him. And so it's just a great way to meet chicks to hang out with the Messiah. But there's a, there's a portion in here where they're actually like writing the Beatitudes. It's so funny. And I'm going to have to edit it because it's definitely rated R. But here we go. So he goes, hey, how are we doing on the Beatitudes? Pardon me? The blesseds. Ah, we've got uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, the pure in heart, the whiners, the meek. Wait, what are we giving the meek? Let's see. Uh, Blessed are the meek, for to them we shall say, attaboy. (laughs) That's a little weak. Yeah. Let's let's let the meek inherit the earth. Can't Can't you give the earth to the whiners? Well, then cut the whiners and give the earth to the meek. Okay, earth to the meek. Here we go. Blessed are the peacemakers, the mourners, and that's it. How many is that? Seven. Not enough. We need one more. How about the morons? No, Jesus, not the morons. You've done enough for the morons. Nathaniel, Thomas. No, no. Blessed are the, the morons, for they, uh, I don't know, they shall never be disappointed. No, Jesus, I'm drawing the line at morons. Come on, Jesus, why can't we have any powerful guys on our team? Why do we have to have the meek and the poor and the oppressed and the pissed on? Why can't we for once have blessed are the big, powerful, rich guys with swords? Because they don't need us. Okay, but no blessed are the morons. Who then? Sluts? No. How about the wankers? I can think of five or six disciples who would really really be blessed. No wankers. I've got it. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Okay, better. What are we going to give them? A fruit basket. (laughs) You can't give the meek the whole earth and then these guys a fruit basket. (laughs) Give them the kingdom of heaven. No, the poor in the spirit got that. Everybody gets some. Okay, then just share the kingdom of heaven. I wrote it down. Hey, we could give the fruit basket to the morons. No morons. (laughs) Uh, It's so funny. And I I share that because it's funny. But but also because I think sometimes this is how like the Beatitudes, which is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, how it kind of strikes us, right? It's like where in the world did Jesus get this, you know, like, where is he pulling this from? Uh, it, this is not what I know to be true of the world, right? The poor in the spirit are not ahead of the game. Uh, the mourning, the mourning is not a blessed experience. Uh, the meek do not inherit the earth, right? The strong do. And so where did he come up with this? And so I, I share this because this is at, at one point, oftentimes like religious people, Christians, the Christian community, where we have two risks, when it comes to the Beatitudes, and I see like churches and people, we, we go one of these two ways a lot of times, right? And risk number one is this, uh, that we write Jesus off, right? His words strike us as very strange, right? They, they contradicts what we know to be true of the world. We don't understand it. It just kind of gets filed away like, well, he didn't, surely he didn't mean that. Right? It's, it's poetry. It's shock value. It's a communication device to get attention. It's a string of philosophical and moral niceties. That's all. Certainly, he can't be serious. But here's the thing. When it comes to the Beatitudes, these are supposed to shock us. They are supposed to be a jolt to our system and to turn what we know upside down and challenge those things. In fact, I love, um, I mean, it should cause us to really do a gut check. And I, I love what Brian Zahn writes. He writes this. He says, the Beatitudes are deliberately designed to shock us. 
Right? If we're not shocked by the Beatitudes, it is only because we have tamed them with a patronizing sentimentality. And being sentimental about Jesus is the religious way of ignoring Jesus. Too often the Beatitudes are set aside into the category of nice things that Jesus said that I don't really understand. Right? So we never really deal with them. Right? We stick them on coffee mugs and we embroider them on blankets and we put them in picture frames. You know, and we say, oh, that Jesus is so, so poetic, that Jesus it's such a gift for communication. Moving on. Right? But here's the thing, right? Jesus was not spouting off poetry that day when he stood up on the mountain. Right? He wasn't showing off his oratory skills, and he certainly wasn't providing content for the Christian trinket industry. Right? He was making an announcement. Right? God was doing something different in this world. Right? He was telling us what the kingdom of God looks like, and what he is telling us is to be a part of the kingdom of God, what God is doing, what is breaking into creation starting right now, completely butts up against and pushes up against. It is antithetical, opposite to what we have come to know and understand and assume about the way the world works and who is blessed and who is not and who is in and who is not and what it looks like to be faithful and what it looks like not to be faithful. In fact, I would say this, God's kingdom and the kingdom of this world, which is, of course, the one that we swim in every day, we've grown up in it, uh, we're fed it all the time, even when we're, we don't know it, we're swimming in it, uh, that they are fundamentally opposed to each other. Part of what makes this so shocking, right? They, they look nothing alike. They value different things, right? And they honor different people, right? And they function in opposite ways. Like God's kingdom is the yang to the kingdom of this world's ying, right? It is, they are antithetical to one another. And so, when Jesus stands up on the mountain and he announces, listen, God's kingdom is at hand, it's coming, it is starting right now, and this is what it looks like, he is challenging the fundamental assumptions of everybody who would hear his words and turning them upside down, right? So I would say this, so shocking were Jesus' words on that day that for most of the last two millennia, people have tried very, very hard to rewrite these words. Right, some people have done it simply by, by explaining them away as just moral niceties or whatever, something that we don't understand and we don't have to understand, something that it means what it doesn't actually mean, or we rewrite them simply by ignoring them and going on with our lives. And then we Christian the way that we live as wealthy Western Americans. Right? And, and I know we wouldn't say this, all right, but if we were to rewrite the Beatitudes based on sometimes how we live, they might sound a little something like this. Blessed are the suburbanites. For theirs are the comforts of the middle class. Blessed are those with new phones and lots of memory, for they shall be spared the spinning wheel of death. Right? Blessed are the educated and hardworking, for they deserve to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Blessed are those who get even, for they shall have the last laugh. Right? Blessed are those with the most guns, the biggest bombs, and the largest army, for they will inherit what's left of the earth. And blessed are the Americans, for they're number one. Right? So, I mean, we wouldn't say that out loud. Right? But if you were to just look at the way that sometimes we live, I mean, man, this is, and you, and you look at what this sounds like compared to what Jesus sounds like and what he's saying here, and they're so different. In fact, I want to do a little experiment, and I'm just going to read to you literally the opposite of what Jesus said. All right? This is a version of the attitudes, literally the opposite of what Jesus said, and I just want to challenge us to do a little self-reflection. Right? If not on yourself, reflect on everybody else. And you just tell me if this doesn't sound like us. <laughs> Blessed are the self-sufficient and self-reliant, and independent. Blessed are those who have fun, enjoyable, pain-free lives. Blessed are those who have made a name for themselves. Blessed are those who have had the best resumes. Blessed are those who reward hard work, oppose laziness, and judge people only by their merits. Blessed are those who are only mildly committed to their religion. Blessed are those who mind their own business. And blessed are those whom everyone likes. Amen. Right? I mean, doesn't that sound like us? Right? If not what we do, what we strive for at least, what we value or what culture tells us, this is what it means to be blessed. Hashtag blessed looks like that. Right? If you were to tweet all the blessings right, of what you would love to be true of your life, what we're working for, saving for, planning for, dreaming about, what we value, it sounds a lot like that. And literally, this is, that is the opposite of what Jesus proclaims to us on the Sermon of the Mount. Right? Nowhere, and I would say this, nowhere in Scripture will you find support for that kind of thinking and living. Nowhere. Right? That is not, that is the antithetical opposite of the kingdom of God. Right? That is, that is kingdom of this world thinking. That is empire thinking. Right? That is, that is, uh, when I say empire thinking, it is top down, power over, got to get mine, look out for number one thinking. Right? But all of us have been conditioned to think that way. And so 
Jesus turns all of that upside down and says, no, 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 no. To be God's people, to be a part of the kingdom of God, this kingdom that's going to be breaking into the world through my people, it's going to look so different from what you've come to know and understand and work for and strive for. Jesus says life in the kingdom is contrary to what we expect and that blessing looks very different in the kingdom of God. Right? And so I say all that because if that is the case, we cannot tuck the earth-shattering pronouncement of Matthew 5 nicely into the housewares department of our local Christian bookstore. Right? Nor can we tame Jesus or his message. If we take him as he is, he won't let us. Right? We must allow the Beatitudes to be as shocking and challenging and counterintuitive and upturning, upsetting, upending as they are and as Jesus intended for them to be. All right, so that's risk number one is just glossing over. It's really nice, Jesus. What's next? Right, but I think there's even a, a, a bigger risk for those of us who are church people, religious people, right? Even if you don't consider yourself a religious person, you're in this room, so you're implicated, right? But those of us who have any religious bone in our bodies, uh, we have another risk, and it's just as dangerous and tempting as this. We turn the Beatitudes into just another set of religious laws to follow, just another set of rules, right? And so we read the Beatitudes, and it's like, uh, be poor in spirit, be mournful, right? Go and be meek, All right? And we religious people, man, we're good at this. Man, we're good at this. I, there's something in us, right, just as achievers uh, <laughs> that want so badly to turn Christianity into a list of do's and don'ts to earn our spot at the table of grace, but Jesus won't let us, right? And so you just got to understand, we may want to try to move these into the, the, the circle of commandments, you know, and imperatives, but you got to understand that's not what Jesus is doing here. In fact, as we, and I hope you'll read the Beatitudes for yourself and just marinate, marinate on them with us uh, in the weeks to come. But if you read them, you will find something very interesting, and that is that there are no imperatives. There are no imperatives in the Beatitudes. There are no commands. Jesus doesn't tell us to go do anything. He is pronouncing something. He is describing something, right? It, it, is, it is a pronouncement more than anything else. He, what he's not saying is here's how you earn your way into the kingdom of God. This is what it looks like. This is what you got to do. Now get to work, and then you'll be in. That is not what Jesus is doing at all, right? He is saying, look, as you come to know God and what he's like, these kinds of things are going to be more and more true of you, right? As you become shaped by his love and his grace, like this is a pronouncement. It is good news. Blessed are the poor in spirit. As you come to know that God, these are the kinds of things as you journey with him that are going to become more and more true of you as an individual and as you as this collective people in this world. You're going to shine, and you're going to look so different, All right? But don't you dare make the mistake of taking this good news and make, turning them into commands, right? And so in a sense, we could say when it comes to the Beatitudes, it's like a really good gospel litmus test, right? So if you kind of want to, if you've been following Jesus for some time and you want to kind of see how you're doing as far as being changed, allowing the gospel, God's grace, his character, his person to actually change you, you know, the, the Beatitudes can be really helpful to read and be like, huh, is this actually becoming more and more true of me or am I thinking still living and working for and striving for the kingdom of the world kind of stuff? Or am I becoming more like this? It can be very helpful in that sense, but first and foremost, it is a pronouncement, it is an announcement, and it is good news, right? Jesus starts by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. There is nothing good about being poor in spirit. In the original language, this is not a positive quality. This is a negative quality, right? The best translation I've read, it says, blessed are those who are bad at being spiritual, Right? Blessed are those who are bad at being good. And Jesus is, <laughs> says, oh, yeah, for just so you know, the kingdom of God is for you. Right? God, is, God is for you. Right? It's like he's saying, look, and you've got to know this. Okay? I'm not against commands. And I'm not, com I'm not against like, encouraging and challenging people to do this. If you've been around, you know that. Jesus is going to bring the heat, just so you know. Three chapters. He's gonna, he has like 60-some commands that he's going to just... Like, this is what it looks like to follow me. This is, this is the kingdom of God, and man, this is what I'm inviting you into. It's a whole new life. But before he goes there, it's like, you got to, let's not get the order wrong, okay? He says, this is what flows out of being shaped by God's grace. When you know how good God is, and you're living more and more into the kingdom of God, this is what it looks like. These are the kind of decisions you're making. This is how you treat people. This is how you don't judge people. This is how you extend grace to each other. This is what we do with relationships and our money and our whole of life. Jesus is going there. But he begins by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. 
Blessed are the people who are bad at being spiritual. Blessed are the people who are bad at being good. He says, that you're never, this is not how you get in. He's saying, you're never going to believe who's in. You're never going to believe who God is for. It defies the values of this world. It stands in stark contrast to the demands and commands of religiosity. He says, you'll never believe who's, in, who's on top in the kingdom of God. It's those who are on the bottom. Right, it's those who are really bad at being spiritual. It's those who have lost everything and find themselves in ashes. It's the destitute, the brokenhearted, the failures, the burnouts, the flameouts, the down and outs. Right? Theirs is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is available to them. It's falling on them. It's crashing into earth where they are. Right? I, I love what the scholar Frederick Dale Bruner says about them and what this word blessed actually mean when Jesus says, blessed are these, blessed are these, blessed are the poor in spirit. He says, in effect, Jesus is saying, God's blessing on you, poor in spirit, for God is on your side. Right in one fell swoop, before he gets to any kind of commands or imperatives, Jesus starts with the gospel of grace, and he says, you have to know why I'm here and what my Father is like. For all of you who don't feel like you measure up, right, for all of you who struggle to be diligent and faithful and spiritual, and you look over at those people, and they seem to have everything going for them, they know how to do this and do it well, and, and I just am always lagging behind and falling on my face. He says, I am for you, and God is on your side. Right, and you've got to remember who Jesus is talking to in this moment. Remember, when Jesus saw the crowds, he goes up on the mountainside. Right, the disciples are listening, but they're not the only ones listening. Jesus had a lot of private conversations and teachings with the disciples. But in this moment, with this mishmash of humanity, this huge group of people that are all over the spiritual spectrum and all over the sin spectrum, whose you know, skeletons are you know, many in the closet, right? prostitutes and thieves and, and rabbis and you know, like everything in between. And Jesus is saying, just so you know, blessed are the poor in spirit for God is on your side. And here's the thing. <laughs> because we are Americans, because we are good Western, oh, pick yourselves up by your books, bootstraps, and, you know, like we're just competitive, achieving kinds of people, I think we immediately want to jump to then the why. Why? Right, why, why are they blessed? Right, what is it about the condition of being poor in spirit that deserves the blessing of God, right? And the thing is, Jesus doesn't give us an answer other than to say, well, because God is like this. It's just part of who he is. It is what he does, right? And I love that because you start to read the gospels through this lens. And what you find in Jesus's life and ministry is over and over and over, he's pronouncing favor and he's healing people and he's, he's doing all these things. And over and over and over, we're, there are a lot of times we're not given the why, but we keep asking it as good Americans, why, 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 why? Why is he doing this, right? And so, like, uh, I love this. Chapter 14 of Luke. Blessed, here we are again. Blessed are those who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. I love that imagery. The kingdom of God is a party, y'all. And then Jesus says this, tells a parable. He says, a certain man, right after this, by the way, connected. This is the same thing. Blessed are those who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And now he's going to talk about that feast. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent uh, his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, uh, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Uh, please excuse me, which you would never buy a field with actually going and seeing it. Another says, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. You, you would never buy a bunch of oxen without trying them out. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. No explanation necessary. <laughs> the servant came back and he reported this to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. And then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Jesus does and says things like this all the time. And we want a why. Well, why is he throwing a banquet? I don't know. It's what God is like. It's what he does. All right, what, why, what's the occasion for the party? Well, I don't know. We don't know. doesn't say. Just 
who God is. It's what God does. Right, go ahead, to, you'll notice in chapter 17, right? He's walking through Jerusalem, goes between Samaria and Galilee, which is not something you would normally do, but that's Jesus. And he was going into a village. When he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. And they stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And Jesus heals him. Well, why? I don't know. It doesn't say. Why? 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 It's just who Jesus is, I guess. Chapter 19, we find this over and over again. Zacchaeus, he's, uh, is, Jesus enters Jericho and was passing through. And a man there named Zacchaeus uh, was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. Right? In other words, he had made his money by taking money from his fellow countrymen, fleecing the hardworking people all around him. He was despised. He was not liked at all. He sees Jesus coming. He's a short little guy. Can't see over the crowd. Climbs a tree. And Jesus sees him and says this, Zacchaeus, come down immediately, for I must stay at your house today. And he does. Why? 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 Endlessly we find favor. Grace, blessing, embrace. Well, why? Why? Have any of you seen, uh, there's a great documentary called Man on Wire. Have any of you seen the documentary Man on Wire by chance? Oh, man, guys, highly recommended, highly recommended. In 1974, it tells the story of, in 1974, a man by the name of Philippe Petit, Frenchman, climbed up the uh, two towers uh, with some of his buddies, spent three days uh, illegally fastening a cord from one to the other, and then uh, one day, finally, when they were all set up, he walks out onto the wire and proceeds to cross between the towers. And we're told, actually, when he was a little kid, he was at, like, a doctor's office or a dentist's office, and he saw renderings of the two towers, and he wrote, he drew a line between the two. He said, someday, someday, I will walk between these two towers. And so he does. <laughs> he actually walks out. He lays down on the cord. For 45 minutes, he dances across that wire. 45 minutes. He passes back and forth eight times. And at one point, cops finally get up on the roof, and they're shouting for him to come down. You know, and so he walks up to him, kind of pretending like he's going to get off. And right when he gets, like, just about arm's length, he backs out on the cord. And he just does this for 45 minutes. Uh, just shocks and amaze. I mean, the images are just, the video is phenomenal. It's so, so good. Right, and so he, he gets arrested, and they take him uh, downstairs and put him in the patrol car, and just this massive media, you know, they descend on him, and everybody is asking him, like, why? <laughs> why did you do this? And actually, we have a short little video clip of him addressing this. I love it. Why don't you go ahead and hit play? I say it's about $1,000 worth of cable uh, and the rigging outfit itself. It's magnificent the way he did it. Did he say anything about why he was doing it? No. Why did you do it? I will, I will explain. I will take the time and say. You know, why? Why? And that was a very, again, in my way of seeing America, a very American finger snapping question. I did something magnificent and mysterious, and I got a practical why. And the beauty of it is that I didn't have any why. Why did you do this? Oh, that's the thousand uh, why in this morning. There is no why. <laughs> Are you sold yet? Oh, it's so good. So good, I love that. They ask him why. It's like such an American question, why? You know, the French don't ask why, you know. It's so good. Right, but Jesus steps up. And he says, that, you know, Philippe says, there, there is no why. And Jesus likewise stands before the crowd. Right, people all over the spiritual spectrum. All kinds of sin and their not so distant past, some of them. Last night, the morning of. Right, and Jesus stands in front of all of them right, and says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Or, blessed are those who are bad at being spiritual. Blessed are those who are bad at being good. And God is on your side. And we're not told why. It doesn't say. Other than apparently God is just like that. It's just the kind of God that he is. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those without a wisp of religion, the pathetic, those who haven't kept the covenant, those who don't believe all the right things, those who really, really have screwed up their lives in an endless litany of ways, God is on your side and the kingdom of God is yours. All right, God has saved you a place at the table of grace. He has swung the door open wide. The feast is ready. Take your seat. 
right, to all those who do not deserve the blessing of God, Jesus says the blessing of God is here and it's yours. All right, that, that, my friends, is the gospel. That is, that is the gospel. Before Jesus gets into any of the imperatives and commands, it's like we need to start where we need to start. And you need to know everything that is going to come to follow is shaped by this one all-important truth, and that is that God is on your side. Right, for those of you who don't deserve it, God is on your side. Right, and anytime we, want, we try to pump the brakes on that and say, oh, no, 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 wait a second, they are not blessed. Right, blessed are the hardworking Blessed are the Republicans or whatever. You know, blessed are, you know, the diligent and the faithful and those who, who actually do the right things with their money and, and those who actually read their Bible and blah, 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 A, B, C, D, E. Right? And, and I think for those of us, any time that we start to pump the brakes on gas, we start or on grace, or we start to think that, you know, we're more deserving of them and they're more deserving of that, in that moment, I would say, man, we are actually rich in spirit and maybe, just maybe, we have to wrestle with the possibility that Jesus is not announcing anything to us because Jesus swings that door open really wide. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Right, the gospel, the Beatitudes, this Sermon on the Mount, does not begin with a command or imperative. It is simply an announcement that God is doing something that we have not seen before in this world and that God is on your side. Right, and so Jesus gets up and he just says, you know, for those in this section, this big mishmash of humanity, for those over here who've had an abortion, God is on your side. And for those over here who have not been faithful to your spouse, he says, God is on your side. Right? And to those you know, of the, us in this room who you, know, you, you struggle to stay away from certain websites, and if we could publish your, your web history log up here, it would be very awkward and uncomfortable for all of us. And to you, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is available to you. And he swings the door open wide and says, come and take a seat at the table of grace. And before you hear anything else that I'm going to say in the, the chapters to come, you need to know, first and foremost, all of this flows out of one central truth, and that is God is on your side. All right, let me pray for you. Lord God, I know that in a, in a room like this, that a message like this strikes us in all kinds of different places. And for some of us, we find ourselves tempted to brush you off and to brush Jesus' words away, to not wrestle with the gravity of what he is saying and announcing to us and what we're being invited into and just kind of move on with our religious business. And maybe for others, it's, we really just struggle so much to, to think that if there is a God, that he is on my side. Knowing what I did last night. Knowing what I did this week or this morning. And, and in this moment, Lord God, I ask that you would just cut through the clutter and speak your words straight to our hearts. That you are on our side. And if we misunderstand that, we will misunderstand everything that Jesus came to say and to do in our midst. That his life and ministry was a string of acts of love. Opening the door wide at the table of grace for all who would come in. And Lord God, for those of us who or maybe the more religious types that just immediately want to jump into, well, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do, God? What do you do? What should I do here? What do you want? And we start checking off the checklist, Lord God. I just ask for, right, just for this morning, for now, that you would just enable us to stop. Stop. We'll get there. You're going there. And just sit on this one truth that God is on their side, our side that we are loved exactly as we are, not as we should be, because there's not a person in this room who's as we should be. But the announcement of the kingdom of God is not an endless litany of to-dos and to-don'ts, but 
something that is breaking into this world that flows out of love and grace and that any obedience ought to be a response of thankfulness for the love that is already ours, the kingdom that is already ours, the grace that's already ours. And that's the gospel, Lord. And just as Martin Luther said, I forget it every day, which is why we need to keep coming back to it over and over and over again. So we come before you now as your church, as your community of sinning saints to sit on this truth and respond in worship. We pray these things in your name.